Well, good day, church. It's great to have you connecting with us as we want to continue to engage with God's Word and learn from it together. Uh, for, for decades now, there's been uh, a sentiment that the power of love is what's needed to bring humanity together. We need more care. We need more compassion. We need more acceptance of one another. We see this in the songs uh, that are written back in the 60s and 70s. You've got songs like uh, uh, Jackie DeShannon's uh, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. Uh, progressing through time, you get uh, Marty McFly, uh, Back to the Future. Uh, made the, the, the theme song comes out, The, the Power of Love. And then uh, more recently, uh, artists like Carrie Underwood in just recent years uh, has written um, Love Wins, that uh, it, it can put a world that seems broken together again. She says, I believe that in the end, love wins. And of course, that love wins was uh, dominant in the... the was highly successful in the same-sex marriage uh, debate of a few years ago uh, together with uh, Love is Love. Uh, the, the, you know, we recognise there's the need for a solution. There's a need, in, we see it in wars, we see uh, the, the issues of corporate greed um, and racism and poverty and the sharing of resources, which, uh, or the lack of sharing of resources, which essentially contributes to, to climate change and so on. There's um, people's responses and government responses to the pandemic. And is there a sharing and is there, is there love? We, we recognise the need for a solution um, for, for this working together, this partnering in love. And by and large, Jesus agrees uh, we, we see uh, it, that the concept of, of love is an important theme, a, a big theme in his teaching. In fact, it's actually likely that this teaching, this Christian teaching about the importance of love is really at the foundation of uh, much of our attitudes in the West. It's, it's where it's derived from. A lot of people don't recognize that. They don't specifically uh, ex see their deriving, how they've been influenced by that teaching, but it, is, it has been a significant influence nonetheless. Because let's face it, we don't get the idea of loving one another from um, survival of the fittest and the strongest survive, or, 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 or it's karma. You get what's coming to you. Uh, so th there's this strong idea, but Jesus presses this idea of, of love much further than just sort of mere sentimentality. Uh, you know, what, what sort of love do we need in order to mend things, in order to be able to solve the ills of the world and the ills of our lives? Where does this kind of love come from? And because uh, we don't really appear to be any, very good at it, really, because we keep having these uh, anthems to, to, to love each other coming throughout the decades and, and still we have all sorts of problems. So we want to continue journeying through uh, the, the story of Jesus' life is recorded by Luke. We're up to chapter 6 uh, from verse 27 today. And we're going to explore this teaching of Jesus about, about love and about what kind of love he's, he's urging us to and, and where that comes from. So let's turn to Luke chapter 6, uh, beginning from verse 27. And uh, John's going to read that for us. Good morning, church. This morning I'm reading from Luke 6, starting at verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others could do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So far the reading. 
So here's the thing. Uh, most of us are inclined, the most people we interact with, inclined to think of themselves as, as fairly loving. Not too many people go around thinking, you know what, I just really hate people. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think, no, I'm pretty, pretty loving. And uh, yeah, there's a lack of love out there, but the, the lack of love is, is other people. Uh, we need other people to be more loving, but, but by and large, I'm a, I'm a pretty nice person. Um, it's, it's human nature, really, to overinflate our own sense of, of sort of, of, of righteousness, of our being in the right place, being in the right. Uh, and, but Jesus here in this passage really challenges, challenges us to reevaluate what real love looks like. And, and frankly, it's pretty uncomfortable. It, it's a real challenge that he presents to us. You see, what are the sort of self-assessments that we make about whether, whether we're loving or not? Perhaps you're inclined to think of things like, well, you know, we've got chickens and we, we share our eggs with our neighbours and, and our neighbours, um, they check our mailbox while we're away. You know, we, or, or perhaps we think of our relationships. You know, we've got friends in church and uh, we invite them around. They invite us around and we enjoy um, good times together and we've got common interests. Uh, maybe you're inclined to think of the, you know, your interactions on social media. When you see someone struggling, you, know, you, you, sh- you share that, that love emoji. You share that care reaction uh, to support them. And, and you know, they're, sure, they're, they're all good things to do. They're, they're, they're loving in their way. But, but Jesus says, hold on a minute, because they're not really a sufficient measure of what it means to truly be loving. And he says, um, they're not really such a good measure because even those who we kind of consider actually bad people still do those sorts of things. They react to other people like that, where there's kind of this reciprocal, you know, I'll help you, you help me. We're nice to those people who are nice to us and kind of everyone functions that way. Uh, the, the, the companies that perhaps, you know, we're, we think they're just out for profit. You know, even, even those who are not noble in their business dealings, they can recognize that, you know what, if we serve our customers well, they'll keep coming back. And so they can be nice on that score. Uh, we see that the banks, you know, big banks who just um, maybe... A, um, in power, they're, they're controlling because they've got the money. You know, you know, they lend to people, don't they? But they lend to people expecting that they're going to get it back. Uh, organized crime, you know, people in organized crime, they've got relationships that they, they draw on. You know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I remember a, uh, listening to a, a message from a, a pastor in, in uh, Canada and um, he was the kind of pastor who's... Uh, leading a, a bigger church, is invited to go and um, speak at conferences and so on. And at one stage, he was he, he came to Australia and he was he, reflecting on his experience. I can't remember quite why it came up, but he he made the point. He says, "You know what, Australians they're they're really bad at hospitality. The, the service industry is is woeful." Um, and uh, and it's kind of as you hear something like this, what's he saying about Australians? You saying whether we're unfriendly people? It's like. A, unsubscribe to him straight away but no um, his point was that they don't we don't have a, a significant practice of tipping in in Australia uh, it's not our culture uh, like it is in in North America and uh, and so it, it plays out and the, his experience was that the, the service is not very good what well, does that mean that we're particularly unfriendly uh, maybe uh, but let's face it why why does tipping induce people to serve better because they're going to get something out of it. Uh, are the, the, is those in the service industry in the North America necessarily more friendly? Well, no, they get paid to be more friendly. It's, I get something out of it if I, uh, if I act more generous towards you. Um, and so Jesus challenges, he challenges us. He says, look at what you call loving. And is it really Exceptional. Or is it kind of more like mutually beneficial? Let's think about what kind of love really stands out. Now, there's been this sort of 
movement over time in our culture, a pro pro progression that uh, the inclination to determine truth and determine our identity and who we are, um, what's the real us, for, for more from inside of us than, than from what our culture um, tells us to think. Uh, this is uh, in larger product of the uh, expectations of freedom, where the freedom that we enjoy and that we think that we, we should enjoy and that, that, that we shouldn't have expectations imposed on us by others, by our culture, by, uh, by others. Um, and so we're free, you should be free to love who we're going to love and to free from the, the corrupting preju prejudicial attitudes of family or of um, society or of religion and so on. We, we ought to be free to determine truth, uh, that, that truth that's tr true for me. And uh, so our, our identity is defined from, from who we are. And, uh, but when we function like that, which is becoming more and more common, uh, then if, if truth comes from, from within me, then I need others to affirm it. I need others to affirm who I am, who I'm convinced I am. And if they don't, then I've got to change them. I've got to perhaps silence them. And that's what we see uh, happening. We just kind of get this tribalism happening in social media where people are in, sort of sit in their own echo chambers and gravitate around people who, who will affirm what they think and then attack uh, those who, who don't think like that and, and won't affirm where they're coming from. Now, you might be inclined to think, well, okay, sure, there's this problem out there, but that's just, that's just other people. Uh, it, that's just where our culture's at. But unfortunately, we see too much of the same kind of behavior demonstrated even by Christians in their online behavior or people who, are, who, who call themselves Christians. People out there trying to correct other people with the truth. It uh, doesn't really matter how we say it. It's, we've got to share tough love because, because we've got to, get, got to share the truth and it becomes ungracious and we get all sorts of things that the world looks on and says, man alive, who are, who are these Christians? Why do they react like this? We're not really very good at it. As so many people have had experiences in, in churches uh, where they've been hurt. Um, we, you know, we should, as churches, we should be the best at developing loving community. We should be the best at realizing you know, a, a community that really loves and, and cares for each other because Jesus told us how to do it. He's given us the answer and yet there are so many people who have been hurt. So many people have been poorly treated within churches and, and by Christians, many of whom have, have left and they sort of walked away from the church and said, that's what it's like, I'm not going to be part of it. Others are still there, but they bear the scars, they carry the scars with them. So is our love really extraordinary? Is our love for that which is unlovely? Is our love expressed in ways that it, we don't expect it to be reciprocated? That's what Jesus is calling us to. You know, we might be think we're, we're, we're kind people. We, we let people in in traffic, you know, when we're trying to negotiate our way through the traffic. And would we let that person in who's sort of rudely and perhaps even dangerously cut us off? Instead, we kind of more think when we get further down the road and they get stuck into a bit of a slow lane, they get held up by that set of lights that we managed to get through. You know, don't we kind of, yes, got what's coming to them. How about the attitudes that we see between different generations? The, the baby boomers versus Gen X versus Gen Z and the millennials. You know, the, the attitudes that kind of get expressed. Some are, some are stuck and stubborn in their ways. Others are uncommitted and um, just entitled. You know, you know, how, how, do, we, do we really love across the boundaries? We perhaps love the neighbor who's cooperates and helps we're cleaning out, clearing our mail while we're away. But what about that neighbour who's got really loud music, a really untidy yard, uh, drives recklessly? Can we, can we love them? They're, and and these, these examples I've given, they're not even real enemies, are they? They're just sort of inconveniences. You know, what about, what about the, the activists that we face who are pushing um, scary agendas? What about the, the members of parliament who are trying to progress uh, legislation that, uh, that you know, risks limiting our freedoms? Can we respond in love? Often as Christians, our response isn't 
particularly Christian, as Jesus is exhorting us to. It's often driven by fear. What's going to mean for me? Self-protection. It's a friend uh, who told me the story of uh, when when he was growing up and uh, he uh, had one of these neighbours that's just a bit difficult to, to work with, this lady that lived next door and she wasn't very... <laughs> Made, made a bit made life, neighbor life a little bit difficult. Uh, I think it was things like, you know, when the ball went over the fence as they were playing, it, it didn't come back. And uh, the, 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 the property was sloped in such a way that the water from their property, the rainwater ran into through her property. She didn't like that very much. So she, she tiled up the bottom of the, the fence on her side and stopped all the water. So they ended up with a flood in their yard uh, the next time it rained and they had to put up with this flood of water. And then one day... They, uh, they hear this call, a faint call from, from over the fence. And, and then call again. It was a call from help, for help. This lady is calling uh, this guy's dad. Uh, can you help me? Uh, I've, I've, I'm locked out of the house. And, and without even thinking, the, this guy's dad just responds, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. And <laughs> this guy remembers, he's telling me the story. He says, I just, you know, like, I say, What? Dad, what are you going to do? It's like, this is a perfect opportunity for, you know, come on, you get what's coming to you. You know, how about you just enjoy some time in that backyard, free of all the water that can't get out from our yard. You're just like, what goes around comes around. But no, he didn't think like that. He's like, no, that's not how we function. That's not how Jesus encourages us to function. I'll be there in a minute. I'll come and help you get into your house. See, Jesus says, show a different kind of love. Show an extraordinary kind of love that's self-sacrificial. And that's confronting, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, because we're, we're not like that, or at least we're not very much like that. And, you know, we want to find a way, as we read a passage like this, and he says, love those who are difficult to you. Love those who make life hard. And those who have hurt you, and we, we want to kind of somehow diminish the expectation. You know, maybe, maybe Jesus is just speaking in hyperbole. You know, he's exaggerating so as to make the point. And yeah, okay, there's a degree of exaggeration to make the point. that We can't apply this as an absolute in, in every single situation. But Jesus does intend us to be shocked. He does intend us to be confronted uh, so as to make his point. We should feel the gravity of it and be challenged. This is radical. This is extreme. To love to this degree. So often our desire to soften it uh, probably comes from wanting to be able to justify our attitudes and, and make excuses for not really being loving in certain situations where Jesus is calling us to be loving. Now, it is a, it's a, a challenging Topic And there is an important caveat that I need to add. There's, there's an important qualification that we do just need to explore. Because if we apply this teaching in complete isolation to other teachings, we do run into problems. And, and here the problem I want to address is the fact that we need to be careful that we don't end up contributing to abuse by urging a victim of abuse to apply this teaching. And say, you know, that's what you need to do. You need to uh, pray for your abuser. You need to forgive them. And, uh, you know, that, that's the, sort of the limit of our dealing with the problem. We see that the, the, in the Royal Commission a few years ago into institutional uh, child sexual abuse. And unfortunately, that's, that sort of mentality has been one of the things that's enabled abusers uh, to be protected and to get away with going on to commit further abuse. It's a, it's, it's a tragedy. And so if you're one who's been hurt, if you're one who's been wronged, then yes, there's, there's a degree to which Jesus is talking to you. In, in your hurt and in your, your, your struggle to, to Jesus saying, don't think in terms of retaliation. Don't think in terms of vengeance. And there, that's, that's really hard. You've got to, to rest in God's justice. But for those of us, for the rest of us, we need to be careful. We, as we see a victim, as we see abuse, we ought not to be party to it by, by failing to stand up for the victim. And, and so God loves justice. Yes, he's urging us to, 
to, to love the enemy, but he loves justice. And your priority in responding to that situation of the, a victim and, a, and an abuser, your priority might be um, more about um, not so much encouraging the victim to, to apply this teaching, but rather to, be, um, to bring the perpetrator to justice. That might be where your focus needs to be more, to protect other victims, to protect the honour of Jesus' name by having these things uh, dealt with rather than more hurt going on. That might be where your focus needs to be. Be careful about applying this teaching in just a one-sided way that enables abuse to just go unchecked because God cares about justice as much as he cares about people loving those who have hurt them. So that, that important caveat said, it, this, this passage does challenge us. This teaching confronts us, not because we kind of find it difficult to understand. You know, there's all sorts of passages we perhaps read, there's things that God says in his word, and we think, oh, what's he getting at? What's the, how are we supposed to interpret this? This is really not hard to interpret. <laughs> Um, maybe we wish it was more hard to interpret. Then we maybe have a bit of an excuse. No, it's actually quite easy to understand. It's really hard to do, to love those who, who make life difficult. So how can we possibly love like this? Where, where does this kind of love and attitude come from? How do, we, how do we do good to those who harm us, to those who make life difficult for us? How can we keep loving and being positive towards those who steal our joy, who, who, who take the credit for the work that, that we've done, who, uh, who, who respond to our kindness with hostility and selfishness? You know, I, I know I find it hard. Those who have hurt us, those who have criticized me, those who are, you know, not very easy to get along with, I find it really hard to... To love, and I, I'm pretty sure that, that you, you could say the same. What's Jesus calling us to? How, how can we do this? How can we pray for those who are hurting us? Not in the sense of pray about them in terms of God, give them what's coming to them, what they deserve, but no, to actually pray for them. Lord, bless them. Lord, give them the grace that they don't deserve. Well, such love that Jesus is calling us to comes from, from God himself. As it says in verse 35 and 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. That's where it comes from. That's the source. Be like this because this is what God is like. You see, we, we should feel confronted by this teaching in the sense that we don't measure up to his standard. As he says, love your enemies, be good in this way. This is the sort of response that you should have, not just to love those who love you and for where you'll get something out of it, but to love those who make your life difficult, to make your life a misery and you keep turning around and loving. I mean, we should sort of be confronted with that and go, you know what, I, I don't measure up to that. Maybe I can do it a little bit, maybe I do it sometimes, Maybe I can even do it a fair bit of the time, but I don't do it all the time. I don't love to this degree. We don't, don't measure up to what God is like. See, we can be inclined to things, sort of a common mentality, that God loves those who love him. Uh, you know, that sort of reciprocal thing. We love God. He'll love us back. He'll give us what, what we need. But see, in actual fact, it's telling us here that he is abundantly kind to the ungrateful and to the evil, verse 35. So many people are indifferent to God, like just sort of going about life, like as if he doesn't even exist. He's got no bearing on their life. Some, many people are even hostile to God. It's like, we, I don't believe he exists. I, he's, he's nasty. I want to be free from him. And yet, God keeps loving them, keeps providing for them. God is the ultimate sustainer of all things. And even though so many just disregard him, he keeps pouring out his blessings. So many opportunities, even good opportunities to enjoy. So much food, 
even lovely food that's rich and, and, and delightful to enjoy. So much, uh, you know, it keeps giving them their next breath. And they want nothing to do with him. That's what God is like. If people take his gifts and uh, abuse his gifts and then even have the hide to turn around and say, well, there's problems in the world. And why doesn't God fix it? Like blame him, uh, though he's given so much and they don't want anything to do with him. But he's the cause of all the problems. What an offense. And yet God keeps providing and God keeps loving. And supremely beyond his sort of general provision that we see in the world around us, that he keeps life going and he keeps giving us so many privileges and blessings. Supremely, he came to earth in Jesus. And he goes to the cross. That's where Jesus is headed, as we'll see as we journey through Luke. That Jesus came and he died to rescue the ungrateful and the evil. Me and, and you, if you've trusted and, and put your hope in Jesus. How can we love our enemies? By the grace of God to recognize that I have been abundantly loved as an enemy of God. The grace of God to recognize you've been abundantly loved as an enemy of God, one who is by nature hostile to him and didn't deserve to have that rescue. And how have we been loved? We've been, we've been welcomed into his family, welcomed into the family of this one who we're hostile to, Though we're inclined to be ungrateful for, for all the things that he, he gives us. But, um, we're, we're, we're granted to one day share in the joy of, of, of his glorious presence. Uh, you know, glories like that, that great achievement. Um, you know, maybe we saw some, some great achievements at, at the Olympics. As some, of the, some of those uh, athletes just really pushed beyond and they made a great comeback or they supported one another we say, and, and everyone cheers them on. You know, it's, it's glorious, this great achievement. It's kind of that sense of glory. We, we get to enjoy God's glorious presence, this thing that we say, that's amazing. It just captures me. And we're going to be able to enjoy that for eternity, even though we're those who are inclined to try and steal God's glory and want it for ourselves and want our life to work out and get him take second place. But granted that as we walk through difficult circumstances, even those circumstances which are actually of our own making, even if only in part, you know, that we've contributed to the bad situation and we can still walk through those challenges in the knowledge of God's the confidence of God's uncompromising love, that he's with us, that he's there in the midst of those challenges because of who he is, not because I've earned it. We can face life and the, the knowledge that, that God actually comes and dwells in us and empowers us to live in a different way. Why is it that we don't love our enemies? Why is it we find we can't? We, that it's just so hard. Why is there so many examples of, of hurt coming from Christians? Because we fail to see the reality of the cross of Jesus clearly enough. If that, that truth that is portrayed there, the reality of what Jesus has done for his enemies, for those who are evil, fails to really sink in. We see ourselves as somehow in a different class of person compared to those people who, who are committing evil against us. I, I'm not like that. And we, we fail to see that actually before God we are like that. And as we comprehend the cross more and more, it changes us. And it's, and it's powerful. Because this kind of, I'm, I'm not just going to up the ante, I'm not just going to respond in kind to the way that you've responded to me. This actually enables us to, to move forward in a positive way. When we retaliate, when we are malicious to those who are malicious to us, it just keeps ele es elevating the problem, escalating the violence, escalating the hardship and the hurt. This is a better way that Jesus enables and makes possible. And what's it look like? then, to, to love our enemies. 
Well, it, it, it looks like God. I mean, verse 35, that we be sons of the Most High, that sons and daughters of the Most High, that we, we actually portray the family life, likeness. How is God loved? Well, he keeps blessing. He keeps giving undeserved gifts. He keeps being kind and generous even to those who are hostile. What's it look like? Well, it looks like God's behavior, the way God treats those who are his enemies. And verse 31 is also a guide that uh, as you wish others would do to you, do so also to them. Uh, it's, a, it's a helpful guide. We, we, knowing what we want for ourselves just comes naturally. Knowing how we want to be treated comes naturally. So Jesus is the same, well, use that as your guide. As you want to be treated, treat others. As you want to be regarded, then that's how you regard others. Not with suspicion, not with arguments and divisiveness, not with avoidance of, uh, of them, not judgment, but genuine concern for them as a person. We can't do it without God changing us. We, we fall short. We, we find it hard to love like he's calling us to. The more we see the need for God to bring that change that we need, the more we see how unlike God we actually are, the more we see how incredibly he loves us anyway, the more we will see this kind of love being played out in our lives as the fruit of the grace that he gives us. That's where this love comes from, this love that's powerful, this love that can truly uh, change our relationships and, uh, and shine forth as the grace of God in our lives. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your grace. We thank you that you loved those who were your enemies, those who had tried to rule our lives our own way, who wanted to be uh, God of our lives, who control where we're going, what we're on about, who want to steal the glory for ourselves to, to be the center of our universe. And, uh, and so we find it hard to love those who thwart that plan, to love those who, who upset our joy, to love those who are hostile to us. So Lord, work that change in us. Apply that grace that, that you have, that power to, to do what doesn't come naturally and that we might truly um, see, see that change taking place. See the, the power of of your grace overflowing in our lives in the ways that we respond to others. Thank you for the ways that we've seen that perhaps in the lives of others around us, where we've seen those examples of someone with a real self-sacrificial love that comes from you, the, your, your grace bearing out in their lives. And we pray that we might see more and more. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'd love this uh, connection, this interaction, not to be purely uh, one way, uh, streamed out as a video to you. Uh, if you want to get in touch about anything, whether you're part of the regular part of the church and you'd like some help with something or whether you're not part of the church and you'd like to explore some things a bit further or connect with us, uh, please do uh, connect. Uh, at the contact details through our website or through our Facebook page, you can get in touch and that'll be in the description of this video. That's all for now and we'll see you next time. Thank you.